I'm Lexi and this is Hannah and we're Wild About Conservation. This is the podcast where we explore the world of conservation through discussions with our very knowledgeable guests and this season's focus is on all things ocean. In this episode we're chatting to Donovan Lewis about his two passions in life, sharks and photography. Donovan currently works as a diver at Blue Planet Aquarium and has given his time to chat about the wonderful world of sharks but also how he got started with photography and why it is an excellent engagement tool. We learned a lot chatting to Donovan today. Make sure you go and check out our show notes for the links to all of his amazing photography. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast. Please remember to leave a review, get in touch on Twitter, and if you would like to support us as creators, we do have a Patreon. You can check out all of these links, as well as those photograph ones, on our website. Enjoy! Hi, thank you for chatting to us today. So can you firstly introduce yourself to our listeners, who you are, what you do, your pronouns, and your key interest in conservation? Hello, my name is Donovan Lewis. I am uh, an aspiring underwater and wildlife photographer and filmmaker. Uh, I work at Blue Planet Aquarium in Ellesmere Port. I am a, a he, and my main goal in conservation is to help spread a message about our planet and our natural world through the power of media to the wider range of the public as well. Amazing. Well, we're really looking forward to chatting to you about sharks and photography, and especially using this podcast to spread some of your messages. But first up, I'm going to hand over to Lexi, as I think she has some things to ask you to get us started. Perfect. I do. I do. I'm very excited to talk to you about all things sharks. And as I work in Edinburgh Zoo, in part of the Discovery and Learning Department, I feel like we'll have a lot to chat about. So I'm going to have to keep myself on track with this conversation today. Before we take a deep dive into the world of sharks, I do have a short game that we like to play with our guests. It's a really fun quick fire round, so you don't have to think too much. And we're going to ask you a couple of questions to keep you on your toes and so that we can get to know you a little bit more. Yeah. So, if you could live in any habitat, what would it be? Oh, coral, coral reef. That was instant, I love it, snappy. <laughs> what is something that you're grateful for today? Having the opportunity to dive with sharks on a daily basis. Absolutely, fair <laughs> enough, I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> and would you rather be a dung beetle, a mayfly, or a cockroach? Ooh. A cockroach because of the survivability of them. You can't kill them. <laughs> that was my answer, Tim. I'm with you there. My question is, if you were a cockroach, could you still dive with sharks? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, finally, every episode, we also ask our guests how they get wild about conservation. It can come from watching a documentary to going outside to going for a swim. So, Donovan, how do you get wild about conservation? That is. <laughs> I... Any any way that I can surround myself with getting wild, so as you said, reading a book, watching a nature documentary, or going out in nature, or being at work with the sharks, uh, any way that I can just go out into nature or or see nature in some way or visualise it is how I get wild every day. I love that. And that's such a like tip for everyone is immersing yourself is the perfect way to start, be it in media or be it just on a walk. Um, so picking up from some of the things that you've mentioned, you dive with sharks every day. <laughs> How did that happen and why sharks? <laughs> it, it's Blue Planet Aquarium started my passion. When I went to Blue Planet when I was four, when it first opened, uh, I, I went up to the big window. And at this point, I already had a bit of a keen interest in sharks, but had, it, was, it hadn't blown up in, in, inside my head at this point. I was more interested in humpback whales and orcas. And when I saw Wilma, who I dived with now in the tank, it, I just thought it was the most beautiful, most incredible, most awe-inspiring thing I'd ever seen. And as a four-year-old, I just couldn't get over how amazing they were and how cool they looked. And uh, kids love toothy things, crocodiles, dinosaurs, sharks. And then that was it then. It, like I was just obsessed with sharks. And I read books, I watched documentaries, I went Blue Planet every time that I could get uh, an opportunity to go. And uh, little did I know, 10 years later, I, I would start working at Blue Planet Aquarium when I was 14. And uh, I worked there for a number of years, but I worked on the front of house. So I worked on reception. I worked on face paints, uh, on the shows and the talks. But my main goal was to get on the dive team because that's, they worked with the sharks you know, every single day. And um, when I was at university, I did my dive master. And once 
you know, once I did got my dive master qualification, I then asked if I could help out now and again on my days off or when they needed a spare hand. And that helped get me the experience I needed. And so when a job came up, I, I was trained and I was ready to jump onto the team. And, and that, that's how it happened. That sounds amazing to have like such a big goal that may seem really unachievable and that you've like absolutely geared all of your decisions around it that mm-hmm. you may not be able to start off diving with sharks when you've started at Blue Planet Aquarium but then you've been like no I'm gonna learn what I can here and then move on to this like yeah. that's really inspiring so can mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit more about your education because mm-hmm. obviously you started at Blue Planet when you were quite young but you said you started uni what did you do there? So I studied marine vertebrate zoology at Bangor. Uh, so that's the, the study of the large animals, the really charismatic animals in the ocean. And I originally applied for marine biology. And a friend of mine told me that m- marine vertebrate zoology would probably be more suited to what I was interested in, because I was interested in the big animals, the whales, the dolphins, the sharks. And I, can't, I can say that it was the best decision I could have made because it, it really was best suited to me. In my third year, I was focused mainly on sharks so I did my dissertation on sharks so I did uh, about the, the the similarities or the differences shall I say in what sharks are really like and how the media portray them and also the the curvatures of how many people go swimming in the oceans and how many shark bites there are every year and how the public view sharks as well so it was a big look into all of those things that help um how to the best way to describe it, to see if sharks are these man-eaters or if they're misunderstood. And, you know, at the moment I went to Bangor, I I knew I wanted to do a shark-based dissertation because I felt that that's what I'd been most comfortable at doing. So what was the results of your dissertation? So I found that every year the number of people going in the ocean are going up. Uh, So that's from just bathing in the water to scuba diving to spearfishing to swimming uh, I found that the amount of people going in the ocean are going up. The amount of shark bites are going up, obviously, because there's more people. So they come into contact with sharks more. But the amount of shark related deaths are coming down every year. So they believe the belief that I found and the results that I found is that with the advancements of uh, titanium stitching in wetsuits, the advancements of shark defenses, such as shark cages or electro defenses, these sort of things can help minimize uh, risks. We also understand sharks more than we did. 100 years ago when we started swimming in the oceans we now understand their behavior a little bit more we still know virtually nothing about their behavior but we learn we know a lot more about them than we did so through knowing these things we're able to keep ourselves safer in the water with them i also found that different placements so where you go swimming also will increase your chances of getting bitten so i found that more people got bitten in ankle deep water than they did out in the open ocean or out on coral reefs because of That's the fact so that interesting. it is and it's found that because the visibility is so low and many shark species hunt in these very shallow waters they hunt stingrays they hunt fish they hunt other sharks that being in this really murky environment increases your chances of being bitten because the sharks don't know you're there until you're literally on top of them like you say we're going into their environment i mean i've never been bitten by a shark but I don't think I'd be happy to be bitten by a shark. But I also would have that like moment of, well, I am in your home. I yeah. can't really grumble too much as long as you don't kill me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's a really interesting thing, that talking about the different environments and actually looking where shark attacks or shark bites may happen. And I definitely think that's something we should pick up on a little bit more later because I have some other questions for you first. Of course, but yeah. getting thinking about the tech for being in with sharks and kind of those different habitats and environments where maybe your interactions with sharks might be a bit more prevalent. But before we get onto that, we've obviously spoken about why sharks. Um, and it sounds like you, so you did your dive master, which is the higher qualification of diving. Um, so past your kind of intro dives. So did you also learn to dive when you were at university or was that far, far before then? So if you want to go right back to the beginning, I did my first yeah. scuba dive ever when I was eight in a swimming pool at a campsite in Wales. Um, it was it just the sensation of breathing underwater. It was like taking your first breath all over again. I just was like, wow, this is amazing. And ever since then, ever since that dive in the pool, I was just it, chomping at the bit to get back in the water. Um, but I wasn't able to get in the water and do my qualification until I was 14. And I did my uh, my ocean diver with a club that's that's near myself. Um, 
did my, my dive course, did my ocean dive with BZAC. I uh, didn't dive for two years uh, because of uh, GCSEs, because I was working at Blue Planet. So and I didn't have the money because I was a 14 year old. And then when I was 18, no, no, 17, sorry, I then did my second dive qualification once I found out that I was going to be going to Egypt for my 18th birthday. Uh, and I was desperate to go to Egypt just to experience a coral reef because every time I was going to go swimming on a coral reef, a bad storm would roll in or something to stop me going out on a reef. So this was going to be my first reef, and I was really excited. So I did my um, sports diver, which meant that I could go out to these deeper sites, these more advanced sites, allow me to see better things. And I went to Egypt and saw some absolutely incredible animals. I saw turtles, I saw lionfish, I saw grouper, I saw stingray. And that was a massive passion feeder. Uh, helped really um, in bulk my passion up massively. So I immediately said, I'm doing my dive master. So I went straight into doing my dive master. I started a year before I went to university, uh, but it didn't qualify. It just work got in the way of you know, all these other, you know, life gets in the way of, of being able to do it as much as I wanted to do it. But when I went to uni, because I was at uni, it was basically an everyday thing. And that's what I worked towards. And that's where I got my dive master. Where's the best place you've ever been diving? Oh. I feel like that's a really big question, but I'm, I'm throwing it out there. That is a really tough question. There's a kind of a mixture of different things. So I saw my first wild shark in 2015 in the Maldives. and It was a baby black tip. It was about one and a half foot long. It was a tiny little thing. And I, the Maldives holds a really special place in my heart. It's where I saw my first wild shark. It's where I swam with manta rays, which I was another animal that was way up my list to swim with. Um, so the Maldives is really, really special. But I think for, for what it meant and for what it's done to influence the rest of my life, I'd probably say South Africa. And only on the basis that that's the first place where I swam with a big shark in open water. Uh, which it was a, a four, four, nearly five foot blue shark. And I swam with a few more, but this was the biggest one. And that day meant so much in terms of I got out of the water. And that's when it uh, cemented in my head that I wanted to be a photographer it was that day when I got out of the water from being in the water with blue sharks. And um, so I think to answer your question, I'd probably say South Africa is probably the most special, most influential place I've been. Absolutely fair. And you just mentioned it there because I know that you're a photographer and I like the fact that it was sharks that got you into photography because yeah. you now have married the both, which sounds absolutely beautiful. But did you have any photography experience? Because obviously we've heard that you've, you've, you've done diving for years and you've always had this passion for sharks. Mm -hmm. But where did the photography start? I think, you know, and when I think back about photography, I think I've always had a passion for photography. But because as I've grown up, I thought I want to be a marine biologist. I've acted more on the marine biologist side of things than the photography side of things. But I always love taking pictures. And uh, like the first time I had a camera phone, I always took loads of pictures. When I went to the Maldives, I bought my first semi-professional setup and took some beautiful images in the Maldives and took that same setup to South Africa and to Mexico to take pictures of other sharks. Um, but I had to learn photography as I was going, um, you know, in, in the Maldives. And, you know, I'm still learning now. You know, every day is a school day at the end of the day. And uh, but I do feel like this is what I'd be better suited to doing uh, to help educate people through the power of media, through the power of imagery, especially after seeing the amazing changes that documentaries such as Blue Planet 2 made with plastic. Seven Worlds, One Planet with rhinos, a perfect planet with global warming and, you know, what we're doing to our planet. The, the changes that those documentaries can make, I feel I'd be better suited to aiding in that side of things. Absolutely. I think Hannah and I have a place in our heart for public engagement and education, hence the podcast. <laughs> yeah, definite solid place for science communication. <laughs> and I think that's a really great point that you've made there, that actually when you look at, not everyone, but a lot of people that become science communicators work in public engagement they tend to have a start where they really focus in mm -hmm. on the thing they're interested in their passion they develop the knowledge about the passion and there's all these side skills because that's something I picked up when you were saying you literally went from face painting to working in the shop at Blue Planet to doing all these things you worked your way up and that's such a great example of getting lots of different skills that become so relevant to potentially that really top goal that you have and want to do so 
before we <laughs> completely dive into all of these things, I want to dive into sharks first. Of course. I want to chat about shark husbandry. You are part of the team um, that care for the mm-hmm. sharks at Blue Planet Aquarium. So what is the daily care of a shark, but also a ray? Um, for our listeners, if you want to chat a little bit about the similarities between sharks and rays yep. and a little bit about their care. So to talk about sharks and rays first, they're basically the exact same thing. Uh, for anyone who is wondering, the main way to classify them, sharks have gills on the side of their head, rays have gills on the bottom. That's literally the way you identify a shark and a ray. But in their behaviour and their feeding requirements, is very different. So, of course, rays feed on the bottom. Sharks can feed from the bottom all the way to the top. So, uh, of course, you get manta rays that do the same as well. Um, so the way that we feed the animals at work, for example, is every single animal will have a different way of feeding. So even if it's just slightly different, it's a different way of feeding, and we have to match that as well, Um, not only to make sure they get the right amount of food, but also for enrichment as well, because we have to allow the animals to act naturally as well. So um, to answer your question on the daily husbandry life of a shark, uh, the team, we uh, at the moment, I think on dive team, there's 12 members of the team. Not, not all 12 members will be in on a single day. It'll be uh, between four and five people in a day, because depending on what we've got on, on that day. If it's just feeds and just general maintenance, we'll only have three members of the team in. We'll have a dive supervisor and two divers. Uh, so the two divers, of course, you have to dive for the buddy. Whoever your buddy is that day, you'll be in the water and you'll be relying on each other to keep each other safe, happy, You know, keep each other sane, having a nice giggle with each other underwater. So the day starts with food prep. We come in, we prepare all the foods, uh, depending on how many animals we've got to feed that day. It can take between 20 minutes and half an hour, 35 minutes to make all the food up. We enrich our food with vitamins, to, uh, very similar to Holland and Barrett vitamin pills, um, but for sharks and fish. Once all the food's prepared, the divers have set their gear up, they're in their wetsuits, they're ready to go. We get straight in, we go in and do the feeds. Again, depending on how many animals we've got to feed, feeds take between an hour and an hour and a half every day. Uh, if the animals aren't feeding or are going through a bad day and they don't want their food, I'm looking at the sand tigers when I say this, then uh, the feeds can go on a lot longer, can go up to be over two hours of our day. Then after we've done all of our feeds, we have our general jobs. So that could be anything from backing the sand. So we go down with a big hoover and we go along the sand and um, and clean the sand, turn the sand over. Could be scrubbing rocks, which is a never-ending war uh, that that we're waging on the tank. We clean the whole tank. By the time we finish, we've got to start again. Uh, so it's a never-ending battle to keep the tank clean and, and looking nice. Then we also help out with members of Zoo Team. So, of course, we don't just have the shark tank. We have many other tanks in the aquarium. And there are a lot of the tanks that are quite large, uh, too big for Zoo Team to get in because they're um, some of them are not qualified divers. So we have to put the gear on. We have to get in the tanks with other animals such as um, Paku and uh, giant catfish, the carp, the trout. We get in with the rays and uh, the, sorry, the skates and coral cave. We help keep those tanks clean as well. That is so exciting. Like it sounds like it's a really varied job, but also fundamentally what you want to be doing. Yes. Can I ask about shark babies? Mm-hmm. Like how do sharks have babies? What are mermaids' purses? Does it ever happen in captivity? What do we know about it? Because I know very little. <laughs> so... The sharks, we've, we've got um, sharks at Blue Planet that breed in a number of ways. So we've got the sand tigers that are, uh, the eggs go, uh, they hatch inside and then the babies grow inside the womb and then are born. Um, so the sand tigers, they have eggs that hatch inside the womb, then they give birth to a live pup. However, we've never had that at Blue Planet. We, we don't know why. We get mating behaviour, we get mating happen, we just don't get babies and we don't understand what it is that's stopping them from becoming fully pregnant. Um, But I'll go into that in a moment. We have the bamboo sharks. We have the the lesser spotted cat sharks and the bullhoss downstairs in our rock pool area. They all give, they all lay mermaids' purses. And it happens every single day at Blue Planet. Uh, We never stop with our baby sharks. Uh, If I remember correctly, the numbers last week were close to 30 baby bamboo sharks in our nursery tank, uh, which has reached a point now where we are having to ring our sister sites and say hey do you want some baby sharks and they come and take some baby sharks off <laughs> us there was a day a couple of weeks ago where 
uh, myself and Georgia, we were in the water. We were looking for sharp teeth because that's one of our jobs. We have to go look for sharp teeth. While we were looking for sharp teeth, I get a tap on the shoulder. I look at Georgia and she just points. And there's a baby bamboo shark about as long as my middle finger, uh, black and white stripes all down the side, just sat on the sand. And uh, she cupped it up in her hands and I was a bit gutted. I was like, oh, I never find a baby shark. I always find eggs. And as I was turning around, I saw a baby shark sat on a rock. So there was two baby sharks. <laughs> so I had to cut that one up. And for a little baby shark, they can't half move. They move really quick. Um, and then we had to swim back to diver entry, pop them in a bucket and then send them off to the zoo team and the zoo team go and look after them. We do also get our stingrays give birth, which is always a really exciting day because you can always get between two and seven pups in the tank. And uh, it's always quite exciting because you don't usually see them give birth. Although I have heard of a dive where members of the public have paid to do a dive with us. They were in the water and a stingray swam in, kind of hovered mid water and then just gave birth in front of them. That's something that happened a few years back. But we do get the babies, uh, the stingrays give birth. We have to go around with nets, catch them take them up to our nursery tank and then we help rear them in quarantine as well. Can I ask, you mentioned taking the babies out of the big tank. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So because they're so small, there's pretty much anything in the tank would be happy to have one uh, to eat it. It, It's a a really yummy snack for them. Uh, So we have to, as soon as we see them, even the eggs, if we find an egg, we remove that as well because our trigger fish, uh, Freddy, He's a queen trigger fish, so you can see where the name marries up. Um, he actually will grab a mermaid's purse and will squeeze it because the yolk's quite nutritious for them. So it's it's again it's enrichment, it's part of nature. So we don't you know hate them for that, uh, but at the same time we all we, we try and make sure that we get the eggs out as fast as we can. That makes complete sense, and I can see that's a really interesting um, kind of factor that I think we're going to pick up on in a moment about kind of sharks as the predator and sharks as yeah. the prey because what you've just said shows that you know it's not always them going around and eating other things and being the top dog um mermaids purses can you say why they're called a mermaid's purse um what is that? i think <laughs> the name comes from the fact that what potentially when they dry the way that they open when they dry out it's like they open like a purse um because i've i've got box them upstairs and when they dry they all seem to open with this way that they kind of unfurl like a flower so they kind of look a bit like a purse I think that's where the name might come from yeah and I can totally imagine like fishermen of the day thinking mermaids they've been that's their purse this is where they're coming from washing up on the beach um so yeah Donovan so obviously we're just talking about mermaids purses and if people want to get involved and look for mm-hmm. a mermaids purse can you find them in the UK? Can you just go to a beach and look for them? And if you find them, what do you do with them? Is there something? Can you take them? Should you report them? So you could, if the best place to look for mermaid purses is on a beach, you can go to any British beach and chances are that there will be some there. And I always tend to look for them on the higher tide line. So uh, as you go straight onto the beach, there's usually a nice dark line right up on the upper beach of, of algae that's been washed up. And that's where I always tend to find most of the mermaid purses that I find. If you do find one, Collect it, put it in a bucket, put it in a bag, whatever it is you took to the beach with you that day. Take it home and sign on to the sharktrust.com and they have something called the Great Egg Case Hunt. So you can actually go on their website onto the Great Egg Case Hunt and you can match up the egg case that you found with their identification guide. And then you can report where you found it and when. And you're helping the Shark Trust identify key sites where these sharks might be laying their eggs and potentially be able to protect their breeding sites. And how big are these animals um, in UK waters, kind of our sharks? Are we talking tiny sharks? Are we talking huge sharks? And what about skates? Are we talking something the size of a dinner plate or You've got a, a, quite a wide range of species around the UK. You know, you've got everything from uh, lesser spotted cat sharks and black mouth cat sharks. They only get to a couple of, you know, a foot, two foot in length. Um, you know, we've got species all the way up to the second largest fish in the world, the basking shark that can get you know, 10 metres long. But the, the sharks that usually lay eggs, they're around sort of between one and four, four and a half feet long. Whereas skates, you've got uh, thornback rays that get maybe one and a half feet across, all the way up to the flapper skate or the common skate, although they're not common anymore. They're critically endangered around the UK. Um, but they can have, you know, a massive wingspan, a good couple of feet across. And their egg cases can be about the size of a dinner plate. So, but they are, the egg cases of flapper skates are found, I think, on three beaches in the UK. They're, seriously like that endangered 
Wow. I know in Scotland we have we have a really important egg laying site that was recently discovered. Um, I don't know what I'd do if I was on a dive and I spotted spotted one of my. <laughs> I don't think you'd miss that skate swimming no. past, but who knows? Maybe you would. So, other than their babies, kind of, how do sharks breathe? Um, sometimes we see videos and pictures of them staying in one place. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're always swimming along. Is, is there a difference? Is there a reason for that? Yeah. So you've got uh, ram breathers and buccal pumpers. They're the two different types. So ram breathers, uh, people, they always hear the myth, sharks have to continue moving to breathe. And in actual fact, that's not that true. So it's a very, very small number of species that actually have to continue moving to ram breathe. Species like mako, great white, baskin shark, uh, hammerheads, they have to continue moving. Whereas species like I don't know, uh, white tip reef sharks, bullheads, bamboos, sand tigers even can actually rest on the bottom and pump water through their gills. So they, the way that sharks breathe is they use gills, you know, just, you know, like normal fish or, or some amphibians do. Uh, they breathe water in. When they close their mouth, they push the water up through their gills and it rubs against the, the lamellae, which is their breathing apparatus, and helps them extract oxygen from the water. We also have uh, sand tigers. Uh, the sand tigers we have at Blue Planet they can actually gulp air, which they don't use to breathe, which everyone always thinks that they're taking a breath, which is why we've had a few people ask if they're dolphins. Uh, we've had that in the past. Um, but they will take in air. Yeah, exactly. They take in air and then they store it in their, in their liver, which helps them remain buoyant. And they're, their only shark, they're the only shark in the world that we know of to air gulp and store air in their body. There's been rumours that sand tigers will actually send it out the back door to get rid of it. So answer the question that sharks fart you know um but i've never personally seen that it's gotta go somewhere it's gotta go somewhere hasn't it (laughs) can i ask you a very um probably big question that we probably should have asked earlier but you've mentioned there's different types of breathing in sharks and there's different types of birth in sharks but fundamentally how many species of shark are there how many species of shark do we have in british waters and then how do we classify sharks in a scientific world? So when it comes down to how many shark species we've got around the UK, I believe we've got over 40. That's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah, we've got a, a quite a wide range and a species that people wouldn't expect we'd get. So we get blue sharks, we get makos, we get threshers, basking sharks, Greenland sharks, which can live to be up to 500 years old. We get uh, uh, blunt nose six gill. We get uh, frilled sharks, we have angel sharks, although angel sharks are a bit of a touchy subject in terms of uh, scientists believe that they're extinct around the UK, although they believe they might have found a population off Wales. They're not too sure yet. You know, so we do have you know quite a range of species around the UK. Just sorry to be pained. What was the other two parts of that? Uh, question? How many do we have globally? If we, if you've got a figure for yeah. the species globally, but then also how does the classification work? Because you've mentioned different types of breathing, but also different types of birth. Because yeah. I don't know any about it, anything about it. So as it stands, there's over 500 species of shark on our planet at the moment that we've discovered. But that number is going up every single year. Um, there's a gentleman called David Ebert who I. You know, he released the Sh- uh, Sharks of the World book back in 2013, and it's got every species of shark in it discovered up until 2013 in it. It's a really, really interesting book. It's like I call it the Shark Bible. And he has meant to release edition two of that book for the last three years. And every time it gets to be released, he pushes it back a year because he's just discovered a load of new species and he wants to put them in the book. So it's a, an incredible thing that we're discovering new species every single year, you know, from this huge group. And to classify them, uh, there's many different things that can go into classifying a shark. So you've got your requiem sharks, which is stuff like your reef sharks, your bull sharks, your blue sharks, your tiger sharks. Then you've got your lamnids and your macro sharks. That's your shark species like your great whites, your makos, uh, your thresher, your baskin shark. Then you've got your uh, carpet sharks, which ranges from, or, you know, from your bamboo sharks and your zebra sharks to your whale sharks. Then you've got uh, hexantia forms, which is your six gills and seven gills. You know, there's uh, and then there's heterodontidae, which is your horn sharks, um, bullheads and port jackson and stuff like that. And each one has an identifying feature. So 
these six gills and seven gills don't have a dorsal fin, for example. They only have the second dorsal fin, which is an incredibly ancient form of shark. They've been around since, you know, even before dinosaurs. They've been around an incredibly long time. And then they also have six gills or seven gills. Your lamnids are very torpedo shaped. They have a crescent shaped tail and they're usually got a, a cordial keel, uh, very similar to a tuna or a marlin, which is designed to stabilize the tail to help them in high speed chases. Your uh, oroctolo forms, they're your wobbygongs. They're usually quite flat uh, and they're camouflaged, they're ambush hunters. So there's, you know, different features will break up the different groups of sharks. Um, and each group is just getting bigger every year as well. There's so much information in your brain. I just want to sit here and like pick through it all. Um, but can I ask one more simple question, hopefully? Why do you have to pick up the shark teeth when you dive in? So when people pay to come to a dive with us, they do the shark dive, they get a shark tooth at the end of the dive as like a, an extra little gift to say, here's something to help you remember your dive. Although they will not need any help to remember the dive because they always come out with a massive smile on their face. <laughs> Um, we also use them for children. So children come in to do an access hilarious tour or let's say we, uh, we we have a child that comes behind the scenes and they're really passionate. If we if we find the child that's re- or someone who's really passionate in this sort of area, we really like to make sure that they we give them as much as we can give them to, to help them you know, get into this industry or to, to help feed their passion. Uh, we'll give them a sharp tooth and, you know, children love teeth from anything especially from a shark as well on topic of shark teeth how do you know what a shark eats and why are they suited to being a top predator so different teeth do different things so if a shark tooth is needle like like a sand tiger the teeth are used for grip for holding their prey in place i always think of a fork so if you can imagine you use your fork to hold a stake in place for example that that's what a sand tiger does and you can usually tell that they eat stuff like reef fish, squids, octopus, and other sharks as well, because they keep those teeth to hold their prey down. Whereas great white teeth and tiger shark teeth, their teeth are very large, they're very serrated. Um, I was going to say triangular, but tiger shark teeth aren't triangular, they're um, cox, cox comb shaped teeth. Those teeth are designed to cut and shred through their prey to cause maximum damage over a very quick period. So they're designed to eat larger animals. So um, marine mammals like whales, dolphins, um, uh, seals. Then you've got tiger sharks that are perfectly designed to cut through a turtle shell. Uh, I believe there's only three species that can eat turtles, and that's the bull shark, the tiger, and the great white. Um, but tiger sharks are the best suited um, for turtles. I think it's their main food source as well. Then if the teeth are quite flat, they're, they're designed to crush uh, and grab and hold and um, to, to be able to apply pressure. So species like Port Jackson's, whose teeth, um, the plates literally come out of the mouth. They look a bit like they're, uh, they've got like uh, lip fillers because the way that their teeth come out of their mouth. Then you've got bamboos and nurse sharks. If you look inside their mouth, you can see that their teeth are pointed, but they're actually quite wide in how they're pointed. So uh, they're designed to maximize the pressure. And there is actually a video that was put up a few years back on a shark documentary of a nurse shark placing its mouth against the, 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 the hole of a snail shell and just sucking the snail straight out of its shell and leaving the shell on the, on the bottom. And we can actually hear that underwater with our nurse sharks because we've got two, we've got Cassidy and Sundance. And when they come in to get fed, we feed them, we feed away from us. So we don't want them coming up into our face to be fed. So what we'll do is we'll kind of just gently push them away so that their mouth is facing away from us. And then we guide them away from us and let go of the food. And you can actually hear the <laughs> underwater of them sucking their prey in. They can suck in a fish that's easy two foot long because if the sand tigers drop their food, the nurse sharks are there on the bottom waiting for the food to drop and a whole fish has just gone <laughs> straight down straight down the hatch. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. I like the idea of them going around sucking. So when you're... They're going around sucking Literal their food up. Literal sea hoovers. <laughs> Literal sea hoovers. Literal. They've got the suction power of seven Dyson hoovers. Sorry to... Oh, my to God. How many Dyson hoovers? Seven. Seven Dyson Hoovers, damn. Um, wow. <laughs> Processing all of that information about right. the ways all these different sharks eat and what they eat and how they eat them um, and these crushing plates that are inside their mouths and Dyson Hoovers. Um, so yeah, we can clearly definitely tell what a shark 
eats just by looking at it. What eats a shark? Sharks have been a top predator for, you know, 450 million years. And a couple of million years ago, marine mammals went into the ocean and kind of threw a spanner in the works for sharks. And orcas, I would probably say, are the sharks, especially big sharks like white sharks. It's their main threat, their, their big number one predator. But I would say animals that eat sharks, you'd be surprised that there's a large range of animals that eat them. There's barracuda. Barracudas eat sharks. I think get hold of one. There was an amazing video that went up, uh, that someone filmed, I believe it was in Australia or the Maldives, of a baby lemon shark in the shallows. And out of nowhere, this four-foot barracuda just torpedoes in, misses the lemon shark, thankfully. The lemon shark nearly jumped on the beach to get away from it, and the barracuda shot out into the ocean. So barracudas eat them, uh, stingrays. Um, seals and sea lions will eat sharks if they get hold of one, uh, one of the smaller ones. And most notably, other sharks. You know, that's probably the biggest predator to a shark outside of marine mammals are other sharks. Sounds like it's a dangerous time to be a baby shark at any point. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not only worried about other sharks, you're also worried about other species. And it's like, yeah. no, no, thank you. The, the funny thing that people always forget as well is when sharks give birth, if the, the babies aren't gone by the time the mum has finished giving birth, there's a chance the mum will eat them. So even their own mother will eat them, apparently. So, they, you know, as you said, it is a dangerous time to be a baby shark. They've got to grow fast. Not the most maternal species, then. No. <laughs> Did the babies eat each other as well? Um, I've never witnessed it. but And from what I can tell from reading articles and from seeing documentaries, baby sharks are actually a little bit more social, uh, or at least from the species that I've seen, they're a lot more social than we used to give them credit for. So baby lemon sharks in Bimini, it's been studied that when they're born and they swim off into the deepest parts of the mangrove swamps, there are actually groups of lemon sharks that will team up in friendship gangs and will go around together and will learn how to hunt together and teach each other how to hunt. And look out for each other there is a hierarchy in these groups so it's not as like they're all high-fiving each other there is a hierarchical system but they there is a lot more of a, a closer social bond than we once thought sharks could have and the the you know again i'm just going to go back to sand tigers because i see them every day sand tigers are one of the species that we now know actually have a lot closer social bonds than we want to give them credit for and seeing the ones at work you know you can see that you can see that they are socially intricate that's really interesting. It makes sense that when they're young, they kind of group together, but you mm. wouldn't have thought it innately from yeah. sharks. Um, but yeah, so you've mentioned the work that you do with sharks now. Have you ever been in any involved in any research with sharks or anything? Mm -hmm. uh, so in 2017, when I went to South Africa, I actually went out to work with the White Shark Diving Company in Hansby in South Africa. And I've, there's no words to describe South Africa, if you've if you've never been, you know, for anyone who's interested in this this area of work, I cannot recommend South Africa enough. It is just out of this world. Um, but what the White Shark Diving Company were doing is they were looking at a new population estimate uh, on white sharks. So up until very recently, there was a, a research study that was that was done, and it turned they found out that there are over a thousand white sharks in South Africa, which in itself is quite a low number for white sharks. That's still quite a low number. Um, but they thought, okay, let's try and redo that population estimate. And it's, it took a number of years. And Sara Andriotti, who's at Stellenbosch University, found that there are between 300 and 510 white sharks in South Africa left. So if it's the lower number, the South African white shark population would have been functionally extinct, which is incredibly sad to think that South, South Africa would lose one of its most charismatic species uh, because it is, it's one of, it's the top predator in the ocean around there or one of. So the White Shark Diving Company was expanding on Sara Andriotti's study and was trying to hand out another population estimate or help give data to Sara so that she could make a new one to see if that number was going up or going down. Um, and they're still in the process of doing that. So when I went out, They'd had a bit of trouble with orcas appearing and scaring the white sharks off before I went. And when I went out, I said, have you ever had white sharks eaten or killed by orcas out here? Because 
wherever these two great predators meet, there's always conflict. And they went, no, 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 it's never been recorded. It's never been recorded. And on my third day, I had a 4.8 meter female wash up. Or sorry, should I say we? You know, they did. Um, a 4.8 meter female white shark wash up. And she had a 30 centimeter hole in her chest. And uh, she'd been killed by orcas. And it was the first ever time it would ever been recorded in South Africa. I got to witness the dissection. It was as horrible and as sad and as heart-wrenching as it was. It was incredibly interesting to, to watch a dissection of a white shark because the guys who work there, they said they'd worked there for 10 years. They'd never seen one. And they said, and you'll never see another white shark dissection. This will be the only one you'll ever see. That evening, another white shark washed up. So we had that dissection. We went back the next day, saw the end of a second dissection. And then there was uh, two more white sharks that washed up on Dyer Island, although they weren't recovered. Fishermen told them they'd seen them, but they weren't recovered. And then a month later, we had a final one wash up. And I got to go witness that dissection as well. So it was kind of a, a, a very interesting and heart-wrenching time to work there. And it was heart-wrenching to see the guys out there uh, and their, their work, their livelihood and their passions be put in jeopardy because of two two orcas called Port and Starboard. Um, sorry, to go away from the, the really heart-wrenching story of orcas killing white sharks, the white shark diving company were then using, uh, or we're, we're trying to say, if the white sharks population is as low as the last population estimate states, then these orcas are putting the population more in jeopardy by killing the amount of white sharks that they're killing. So um, it was quite interesting to see that conflict of interest of, you know, you've got orcas, which is one of the most charismatic species in the ocean, and you've got white sharks, which is also an incredibly charismatic species, and both of them are, in, are in, endangered in the ocean as well. So it was also quite interesting to see that conflict as well. Wow. That's that's I've got goosebumps from the sheer size of that female great white because when you consider the average uh, female woman um, is what 1.6 1.7 meters mm-hmm. tall um, at least I am <laughs> maybe I'm short um, and then what did you say 4.6 meters that's 4.8 that's 4.8 that's huge um, and yeah that is really interesting hearing about those kind of conflicts of you see these amazing creatures and obviously this is a natural interaction, but it's kind of when the loss of these species have already been amplified. I'm presuming by, is it fishing pressure? Is it hunting? Is it, why is that population so low? So there's a mixture of reasons. And when I went, I didn't realize, it kind of just puts things into gross um, perspective uh, when you, when you, hear about their environment so to start off with up the east coast of south africa towards durban uh, in the kwazulu natal area there's the shark nets that are put out now the shark nets are basically useless they sit in the mid water so they're floated from the top they go to the bottom but the nets don't go from the top to the bottom they hang in the mid water so but they're there to stop sharks from getting into the beaches although there's a 12 foot gap underneath them so i don't understand what the point of them is um, but these nets I've caught since 1986, I think it was, might be 1976, all the way up till 2006 or 2010. Forgive me on the years exactly. Uh, those nets killed a thousand white sharks. Wow. So that's, if the population is what it is, that's double the population of what it is now. You said the nets until 2006, 2010-ish. Are they there yeah. now still? Yeah so yeah. what in terms of if we want to swim with sharks a mm-hmm. what is a safe way to do it and b what is kind of you know an adaption of those nets is there a better adaption of those nets to kind of deter sharks for example so sarah andriotti and mike rutson who you may have heard of as the gentleman who gets out of shark cages and swims with white sharks him uh, sarah and mike de- were developing what's known as the shark safe barrier and it's it got a GoFund. It did a GoFundMe last year, and essentially what it does is it is a shark net. And I say that with quote marks, uh, based on kelp. So it was observed that white sharks don't like swimming into kelp forests because large predatory sharks don't like any gap smaller than their pectoral fins can fit through. Think of a cat and its whiskers. They don't like going into a gap that's any smaller than a cat's whiskers. So it's now since been observed that white sharks do in fact like swimming in kelp forests uh, through a uh, camera that was put on a great white uh, dorsal fin 
and it swam straight into a kelp forest and seemed to have the best day ever. So what they did is they had these hollow pipes that are attached by links, so they move with the motion of the ocean. And the pipes are filled with anti-shark magnets. So when the sharks get too close, the magnets interfere with the electroreceptors on the shark's face. Um, it stops the sharks from being able to remain comfortable around them. It doesn't hurt them, it just makes them feel a bit uncomfortable. And um, they then swim away and keep away from these nets. And the nets have had a 100% success rate, even with bait, divers, whatever they did to try and entice the sharks in, the sharks would not cross the barrier whatsoever. Wow. Would a barrier like that impact any other animals? No, because a lot of species, such as seals, such as fish, don't use the same electrical sense that sharks have. And it's actually found that these barriers act as an artificial reef. So the sharks don't like them, but everything else does. So there's a positive and a positive. You know, there's they're not as good looking as kelp, for example, but they're better than a net. Yeah, absolutely. And it's this developing technology that will help us find and these wonderful minds that can help find some solutions so that absolutely. there is less human wildlife conflict, because hopefully we're not going anywhere. But also we don't want these species to become extinct just because of our existence. And I think that's a really wonderful example of modern technology working mm -hmm. with wildlife and with people to create yeah. a solution. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, do sharks migrate? Because I was wondering this when you were mentioning the things with the orcas, and I know orcas migrate, but do sharks tend to migrate or do they stay in one, one space? So it varies. So you can get some that are very local. So sand tigers are a fairly local species. They like to stick around the same coastline throughout their lives. Um, whereas white sharks are quite migrational. So they migrate up and down the coastline they live on. Uh, some populations are more migratory than others. But again, we still don't know much about white shark migration patterns. So there was one example of Nicole, of a great white called Nicole, off South Africa many years ago. She was swimming around the shark boats. Orcas turned up. She swam a couple hundred kilometers offshore, took a left turn, disappeared from satellite tracking and appeared in Australia five months later. Um, she did one ping in Australia disappeared, appeared five months later back in South Africa. And it's the only example of that ever happening of population mix between Australia and South Africa, and it's never been seen again. So they have no idea if that was, you know, a purposeful migration to go and mate somewhere or to go and meet white sharks in South Africa, or if that was just her running halfway around the world to escape to a couple of orcas, you know. So we have you know, no idea what that was for. But if you look at white sharks in the Pacific, they migrate quite a lot. So you have white sharks in Monterey Bay, you have white sharks off Hawaii, you have white sharks in Isla Guadalupe in the off um, of the Pacific, off um, coast, is it Ecuador? No, it's off um, Mexico, sorry. And the white sharks do migrate quite a lot around the Pacific. But for white sharks to be moving around in the open ocean, that's quite unusual because white sharks are actually a coastal species. People think that white sharks will swim in from the open ocean the bum off a surfer and then swim back out to the open ocean that's what you know jaws did to white sharks but in actual fact most of their lives is spent within 300 meters of the shoreline so you know it's really quite unusual when you think of this, you know, this massive ocean predator and actually they live right near the shoreline and um, so when if they're swimming right out in the ocean at open ocean it's that's quite an unusual thing to see so that's what's got scientists kind of looking at white sharks in the Pacific Ocean because they're like, why are they swimming out in the open ocean? Are they out there for food? Are they out there for mating, for giving birth? We don't know. Some species like blue sharks are highly migratory. So they swim uh, from they swim from the UK all the way down to South America. They swim back over to, to Spain and then all the way back up again. You know, they're highly migratory. Baskin sharks are the same. Uh, Baskin sharks will appear in Cornwall. Then they move upwards towards Scotland and feed, and then they disappear from Scotland, and we have no idea where they go. One was tagged a few years ago, and uh, it disappeared in Scotland, and it popped up in the Caribbean four months later, and they have no idea why it went to the Caribbean, and then it was back in the UK a couple of months later. So there are some species that will do transoceanic migrations, but there are some that won't, some just like to stay in one little area, um, and it's this this giant jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to put together to try and unlock 
the the secrets behind them because although they're these you know these animals that play a huge part in our culture and so they're, they're on in our films they're in our books they're in our you know our clothing we still know nothing about them and the first part of protecting them is finding out where the key stages of the life cycle are so where they mate and where they give birth for example and um, because you have to protect those sites from you know golf courses from pollution from fishing so that the species has a fighting chance for years to come i love this idea of what you're talking about in the kind of when people think of sharks and someone sits there and goes i want to be a marine biologist i want to be a shark biologist people will think okay i'm going to work with the big sharks but what you're saying is there's so much we don't know Mm -hmm. about where they give birth where they reproduce kind of being able to track them being able to check even not the shark, look at the populations of food that they eat, look at yeah. the orcas that might be hunting them, look at the interactions of people and all of these things that it's really that there isn't just one thing that if you want to work with sharks or do something that you have to focus in on the shark mm-hmm. or a specific part of its life. Um, and it could be that you go and you're this great communicator as you are, um, as well as everything amazing that you've done. And you talk about and share your passion about sharks or you share your photography about sharks. And I am definitely sidelining because I want to chat about your awesome photos right now. Um, so <laughs> in terms of photography, you've already told us that where you kind of got into it. Mm-hmm. Um, my first question is, where can we see your photos? So I've recently set up a website uh, at donovanlewisphotos.com. Um, and I use that platform to, to keep my work as like a if you know for people to be able to go and see and observe it um it's all well and good being on my hard drive or being on my instagram but you've got to have a place where you put all your photos make it easy for people to find them um and i've also set up a, a facebook page and of course my instagram where I, I'm, I'm most active on as well cool we will definitely i was just about to say we'll definitely drop that in the show notes thank you but you said that you got into photography when you're in the Maldives and South Africa and stuff but mm-hmm. are there any specific projects you've been involved in that you'd like to share with us so projects that I've been involved in at the moment I'm just trying to get my feet on the ground and try and just put my feelers out and see where it is um, at the moment the big project that I've helped out with is uh, helping with Blue Planet Aquarium and um, so helping with getting imagery for their social media and for their website and stuff like that. So I went through in the first lockdown, it's probably the first thing that kept me the most sane was uh, being able to go in and just take photos and spend a couple of hours sat in the sun with pelicans, for example, and just snap pictures, you know, um, and that was, you know, what I did. It That was a big project, my first big project that I helped out on. That sounds really cool. Um, I'm also a blogger for scubaverse.com. Um, so there's a, a couple called Nick and Caroline Robertson Brown. So they are a part of uh, Frogfish Photos, Frogfish Photography, and I'm one of their bloggers. So every couple of months, I'll put a, a, a blog out talking about a specific subject, a specific project, a specific animal, and uh, it it can be quite short, it can be quite long, but it's just so that people can have a little insider look into what I do and why I do it. And, a Blue Planet Aquarium, for example. I'm currently in the process of uh, writing a blog series now for them. Um, I'm not going to say what it is, um, but it's some stuff that we've already spoke about and more as well. So from what I understand, you're freelance. So you're kind of like a freelance photographer. You get involved in Project as and when you can. And you've also got this job with Blue Planet Aquarium. Yes. That sounds really exciting and also really stressful. Do you want to share any like hopes with us like where are you aiming to go because you've already got this awesome job with sharks you're already taking photos you've been traveling around the world but what's i mean pandemic allowing what's the goal <laughs> my dream would uh, the the big goal would be to be uh, an underwater photographer filmmaker cameraman for the bbc national geographic um discovery i, I really just want to get the image uh, wildlife images out on the big screen for people to be able to see. You know, the dream would be to work on a project like, I'd, let's say, God forbid it happens, Blue Planet 3. It would be the dream to work on a project like that, honestly. 
that yeah i think all of us that work in conservation as well like get get us in there <laughs> so work in science communication engagement and you know david attenborough knocks on your door that oh. would certainly be a dream uh, i think for anyone and everyone listening so with that kind of if you either the most inspiring photo you've taken or that you've seen if it was the one you've taken that you know that moment that david attenborough knocked on your door what would be the one you showed him wow <laughs> I think I've you know I go back to like when I take the photo. I love the whole process of taking the photo to post production to editing that photo, editing the footage, putting it together. Whereas you get some people that like certain aspects of the whole process. Whereas I'm fine with it all. I think the photograph that made me just go like that, and the moment I saw it on my on the little LCD screen of my camera to when it went up on my on my computer screen, was probably the photograph that, um, well, one of the photographs would be the one that won the Biasa competition last year, which is the one of Georgia and my favourite Sand Tiger, Betty, just because of the the eye contact, the position of them, and just because it was just, it, it just had all the aspects of everything that just makes me go, oh, when I look at a photograph, it just had everything. You know, that's probably one of the most incredible photographs that I've taken just because of how happy I was with it and what it meant to me as well. But there have been quite a few. Uh, I'm going to go through a few. There's a, a photograph of two white sharks I took in South Africa, and there's not a single tooth in the photo. It's just, uh, they always say, don't take a picture of a fish bomb, because it's never it never makes a good photo. Um, but the photograph is actually of two white sharks just about to headbutt each other, and at the last second they turned and shot away from each other. And you're looking at the back of both their dorsal fins while they're both arched, turning away from each other. Uh, and that was from the surface. And that photograph blew me away because of you don't usually get two white sharks in a photograph as well. So that photograph means quite a lot to me as well. Oh, that all sounds amazing. We'll definitely link to your Insta and your website and everything. So people can have a look rather than just it being like, <laughs> OK, I know what a white shark looks like, but that sounds like an interesting photo. <laughs> um, can I ask you about challenges of taking photographs underwater? So obviously you're a diver and I get that and that already learning to breathe underwater and being comfortable with that is a whole thing mm -hmm. but how do you take a photo underwater so it's expensive um so you have to you know <laughs> you get your camera you get your housing um which you know they don't come cheap uh, so you get your housing and then you get all of your strobes so you have to have um two lights underwater you can have one if you want but two is always better because you get more light and you've got to have them on big metal arms. So you look a bit like you're carrying around one of the robots from the first Matrix film with all the tentacles. You look like you're carrying one of them around. So I'm still kind of getting to grips with stroke positioning because it's quite a, it's a lot more complicated than I thought it would be when I first thought, oh, I'll get into a photography. And then um, I was seeing how all these, all these professionals put all their strobes out. And the moment I started playing with strobes, you realize it's actually quite hard because if you have your strobe just an inch too far forward or too far back or the divers six inches further away than you need them to be, the photo can't be used because they're not lit up enough or the shark's not lit up enough or the shark's lit up too much and the diver isn't lit up at all or vice versa. There's a lot of aspects that, that come into framing the, photograph, the photo and getting it lit correctly. To take photo underwater, I, I think the, the best thing I'd say is you know, you've got to buy all your equipment first, which is very expensive. Then you've got to find someone who you can rely on to be a good model if you're taking photographs with a model in um, or someone who's a good safety diver as well. Because you, you know, if you're taking photographs, it doesn't matter how good of a diver you are, you're focused on your camera. So you've got to make sure you've got someone who's got your back as well. Um, and at, at work, uh, we always look out for each other. But if I'm focusing on my camera, my model who I'm taking photos of or my safety diver is just making sure that there's, there's no sharks coming in to have, get their photo taken to get a selfie with me. And... Um, you know, that, that, that's, there's just a lot to think about underwater. You know, I'm starting to slowly get to grips with, with all the logistics of it. <laughs> In terms of animal welfare, because we're quite hot on it mm -hmm. on the zoo, does the strobe impact the animals? Oh. For maybe half a second afterwards and then they're fine. Because it's very, okay. no, no, it's, it's a good question because they're... For years, there's been a lot of, oh, you can't use strobes, you know, because you can't because it'll affect the wildlife. But in actual fact... For, it affects them for half a second a second and then they're just like oh okay that was fine and then they, then they crack on with it uh, the only animal that I will never use strobes with 
at Blue Planet or use Flash with is the octopus. And the only reason why is the chromatophores of an octopus don't recognize Flash. They recognize light and the color of what they're sitting on to help them blend in and camouflage, but they don't recognize Flash. So if you flash an octopus, the chromatophores expand and shrink, and it stresses the octopus out to do it. And to actually flash an octopus a, new, a number of times, uh, it can actually damage an octopus, potentially even kill it. So we do not use flash, and we have someone basically stood guard at the octopus tank to make sure that no one uses flash, especially on busy days, because that's a lot of cameras if the octopus is out and about having a good look at people. And that's a really great point, is that when you walk around Aquaria, you do see all of these signs that say, please do not use flash. And that is for such a good reason, because, yeah, chromatophores what octopus used to change colour, to change shape, to adapt to their surroundings. So you can imagine that, especially in the wild, that if you mess those up, that's really going to damage potentially yeah. the survival of that individual. Um, how do you take a picture first rather than that moment? Say an orca swims past. And how do you stop and go, picture first, oh my God, this is so cool, reaction second? Because that's what I would, i just have the reaction. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's kind of difficult because when I'm at work, for example, if I see a good picture approaching, because you can, because the work, because we know the shark so well, we can plan, I can imagine shots that I want to take and where I want to take them. And then I can go to where I want to take that photograph and then wait and see if a shark comes in. And if I see a photograph lining up, I just point at my buddy and say, you there, and the model will do what they need to do. I line up the camera and start planning how I want to take the shot. In the wild, though, you know, it can be a little bit more difficult because you can't predict the animals. They've got a whole ocean they can go swim in if they want to. So they don't have to come two inches from your dome port to get a nice, pretty photograph uh, of themselves. You know, you do have to think... You have to try and work with the animal and try and plan your shot a little bit better. Um, I think, you know, I remember when I went to, to Mexico and I was just I was on the bus going out to see the whale sharks. And uh, the marine biologist who was on the bus that day, she said, you've all got your cameras. Um, I was the only one with a camera, uh, bar a few people with GoPros. And they said, please remember to put your camera down and enjoy the moment. And I thought that, that was a really nice thing because as photographers, you do get lost in, I've got to get the photo, I've got to get the shot, I've got to get this, I've got to get that. And, you know, you see it at concerts, I'm going to throw concerts in the mix, you always see people with their camera phones looking through their camera phones like this, trying to, you know, get that shot of a concert. But they forget that they're, they're in that moment then, you know, it's not the same looking at it on a, an LCD screen. You've also got to enjoy the moment while you're in it as well. And that's what I always try and do when I'm taking photography. I always just try and spend one minute at least just to enjoy what I'm seeing rather than looking through the viewfinder of my camera constantly. That's really interesting because that sounds you have like those really two defined kind of uh, brain moments of I'm in the photographer mode now, focus on what I'm doing and remembering to enjoy that moment. Because, yeah, we I think I noticed it a couple of years ago when I was going around taking a lot of photos of general nature. You end up seeing everything through a camera lens, which is wonderful, but you need to remember to take those seconds as well. So I think that's a really Absolutely. great message. Um you mentioned your setup and winced <laughs> at the expensiveness. Are you happy to give us a bit of an idea if someone did want to go out and start maybe having a look online, like what camera they need, what you've talked about different ports, is that for different settings um, and all of that kind of thing of how do you get, what's a good place to start and roughly how much would that cost someone? I, I heard from an, a wildlife photographer a couple of weeks back on a podcast I was listening to, he said, if you want to get into this area, pick up a camera and start telling stories. doesn't matter what camera you need, just pick up a camera and start telling stories. So it could be a little point and shoot, it could be a big massive DSLR with the biggest, most expensive lens ever. It could be a GoPro. Just go out, start taking pictures and start telling stories. And that's what I am what I try and do is just tell stories and educate people. Um, you know, if you're wanting to photograph deer, for example, and they're 100 meters away, you are going to need something a bit better than a point and shoot because you're not going to be able to get close enough. So there's this this balance you've got to find and you've got to find your own style as well. Um, you know, every photographer, every filmmaker has a style and a way of doing things. And I'd say to someone to go out and try and find their style, find how they want to take photos, find what they want to take photos of as well. You know, and to 
to, give, to answer the question about my setup, I've got uh, a Nikon D7100. I've got a Nikon D7200 as well, uh, which I use a lot for my LAN stuff, whereas the 100 is my underwater camera. And I've got a Nauticam housing with a, a dome port, a Subal dome port, and two Inon uh, Z330s, which are uh, a fairly new strobe uh, make. And they're basically a big grey box, and they've got a domed front, uh, a bit like a fisheye, and it spreads the light more evenly. Um, and the dome port mixes with uh, a fisheye lens that I've got, so basically opens the whole picture up so I can get a lot more in the shot. So if there's two sharks in the photo, I can get two sharks in rather than a shark and a fin. So it just helps me get more in my picture as well. That all sounds ace. I think you're absolutely right of that. If you want to start, just start with what you've got. I think I suffer with that perfectionism part of my brain where I'm like, I must get all of the technology and learn all of the things first and then I'll start. Um, But no, I think if you've got, fundamentally nowadays, I think if you've got a up-to-date phone you can go out and take some amazing photos and then just start playing about with editing and settings and stuff but yeah I think you touched on it really really well that you've got to think about the subject what you're actually going to be taking because if you do want to take landscape photos you're going to probably have to put it in landscape Mm -hmm. mode and take a wide shot you're not going to want a macro lens for anyway now I'm just going down uh, a little rabbit hole (laughs) but thank you so much for sharing that with us and I think you're right that you have learned as you've gone along and every day is a school day. And if anybody has any reservations, just start, just give it a go. It'll be fine. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about engagement because like you said, you're on the team that not only does the dive in with sharks and looks after the sharks, but you've been part of that kind of education team and stuff as well um, for Blue Planet Aquarium. But what do you do in terms of engagement other than sharing your photography? Is that something you're looking to expand on later on? So I, uh, when I was on the Viet Vista Services team, uh, when I first started, I was really confident about um, talking about what I loved, so about sharks, about marine life. Um, but working on the team really helped my confidence in terms of being able to just stand on a stage in an elf costume or dressed as a spider, for example, because that's what we did on the education team. And just being a bit of a clown, but also educating people in a fun way. And that really helped me kind of go on how to spread a message because I'm not, you know, I'm happy to admit that I used to be a bit of a keyboard warrior in terms of shark conservation. So if I was on Facebook and I saw a video of a shark swimming, look, you know, really peacefully through the water, and there was someone they saying that sharks are man eaters and they're this and that and the other, but yet they'd never seen one or even been in the ocean. I used to take real offence to that because I was like, how can you judge an animal that you've never seen? But I realised that by screaming and shouting at people doesn't work because people then barrel down the hatches, they lock themselves down into their own opinions, they don't listen to what you're saying and they become so closed off to, to, to what you're trying to tell them. So I found that by just simply talking to someone works so much better. You're never going to change everyone and I, you know, my aim isn't to change everyone. My aim is to just plant that seed and just allow people to go, okay, and go away thinking about what I've said or what they've seen or what they've experienced, because that in the long term has a greater effect for conservation than screaming at someone through a computer or screaming at someone on a stage. And something else that I've learned is that education through exposure is a really, really powerful tool. So saying to someone sharks won't kill you or bite you or eat you if you get in the water with one and taking them diving with them and letting them be in the water with this animal that they've said their entire lives they've been told their entire lives will kill them for them to then be like oh i'm in the water with a an 11 foot shark and it's just sleeping because that's what betty does she just sleeps and for them to have that myth blasted away that that realization that sharks aren't these horrible vicious killers is incredibly rewarding and that's the the engagement that we do on the team but i'd also do you know i do a few outreach projects so uh, if blue planet needs someone to go out to a school or to go out to an event so i did a talk in uh, at chester cathedral uh, at summer in 2019 um they sent me out to go do a talk for them it's an hour and a half long and um i just educated a room full of kids and their parents on you know, the on shark conservation and biology and stuff like that. So any form of outreach that I can do, you know, I do a talk every year for the Endeavour Society at Bangor University just 
on sharp conservation. So just any form of outreach education I can do, I'm, I'm there, I'm happy to do it because I'm helping just spread that message a little bit more. Yeah, I completely agree with your sentiment of it's education and conversations that change people's mind or spark a yes. small change. And that's all we need. Um, but no, you mentioned the Sharks Trust and stuff. If people go out on their walks and find some mermaids purses and stuff. Um, and we've also said, if you want to get involved in photography, just go point and shoot and figure it out from there. But is there any way that our audience can like get involved a little bit more? Have you got any ideas about what UK conservation based shark charities or anything? Yeah, um, so you've got white back shark conservation. You've got fin fighters. You've got Shark Trust, of course. Um, you know, and there's a few in the EU. You got uh, EU Stop Shark Finning, which has become quite popular on uh, Instagram at the moment because they're uh, fighting against uh, shark finning in the EU. And then you've also got Shark Guardian, which is the Shark Guardians, which have become very popular in the last couple of months because they passed a bill back in October, I think it was, um, to potentially stop the importation of shark fins into the UK. It was. They got over 120,000 signatures, I think it was, uh, in, you know, in like a week because it was marketed by some photographers and it just exploded and got all these signatures. It was amazing. The best way to get involved is to sign up to a weekly newsletter from any of these sharp charities, you know, become a member or, or read the, the articles they put out. You could do a race or a run to raise money for the charities. Probably say the best thing to do is just to surround yourself with all of these charities, with all these experts, and put yourself, as we said at the beginning, you know, get wild, go out on the beaches, look for shark shark egg cases, mermaids purses, you know, go and experience British sharks. Like I've just um, booked a trip to South Wales in August, fingers crossed, I'm allowed to go, uh, to go and swim with blue sharks again, uh, because I've always wanted to see them in the UK. You know, and you can go up to Scotland and swim with basking sharks, you can swim with blue sharks down in Cornwall, you know, there's there is actually shark diving to be had around the UK. You've just got to know where to go. So I would say to those people to or go dive in a blue planet, you know, or an aquarium. You know, there's many different avenues and ways that people can get involved and, and go do this sort of stuff in the UK as well. And I think just as a slightly shameless plug, whilst we're in a pandemic, listening to wildlife <laughs> conservation podcasts and or following your favourite wildlife photographers on Instagram is a great way to feel a little bit attached to wild. I think that's a great point because the thing is, obviously, we talk a lot about getting to the beach, but if you don't have a beach, you can get out and see all kinds of other things. And really, I think when you see something, especially on social media or hear something, stop, question what you're seeing, go and seek out these knowledgeable experts and educate Absolutely. yourself and share their passions. And I completely agree with your message of sharing your passion and education with people rather than shouting at someone from a stage. By experience, tends to always work better. Um, and everyone has their own opinions. But yeah, I, I share your passion. Um, so I'm going to wrap up, or start to, with a few last questions and a moment for Donovan to basically say, is there anything we didn't cover? Something that you would have liked that we'd got a bit more wild about either talking or that you people would just get more wild about in general no i think i'm quite you know i'm quite happy with everything that we've covered to be honest and to like you know all the questions have been asked have, have been the right questions so no i'm quite happy with everything that's good to hear i'm sure lexi and i i know i have made lots of notes and could have asked you about 700 more questions thank you so much for chatting to us today um have a wild day everybody and bye bye now bye. thank you have a wild day Thank you for listening today. As always, we have been Wild About Conservation and you have been awesome. Please do leave us a review. We would really appreciate it and we do read them all. To keep exploring with us, drop us an email or find us on our socials. All the links are in our description and the show notes. If you enjoy our show and want to support us, we are also on Patreon. Just £1 a month, 25p an episode, will cover our creation costs and anything above that we donate to charity. Thank you to those of you that are already helping us to keep creating. Our chosen charity for this season are the British Divers Marine Life Rescue, who are an organisation dedicated to the rescue and well-being of all marine animals in distress around the UK. Donations will go to training teams of volunteers and maintaining specialised equipment that is vital for their work. Don't forget to look out for our next episode next Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If we aren't there, do let us know. 
And remember, step outside and get wild about conservation. Bye. Bye. How do you get wild? Watching wildlife documentaries. Wildflower painting. Diving. Wild swimming. Ocean watching. Rock climbing. Bird watching. Listening to podcasts. Hill walks. Visiting a wildlife charity.